So I found this very interesting article and I'm actually damn near printing it out and framing it. It's written by a woman named Ann-Charlotte Alstad and she's a member of the left party here in Sweden. She writes in her article what a lot of people like me have known for quite some time and she also cites several statistics which people like me have also been aware of for quite some time. But her article is a unique little unicorn because it's written by a person from the left party and it's also a very short well-researched rebuttal to a bunch of unfounded claims being preached by people like this journalist named Peter Larsson. And I also want to make a pretty big deal about how rare this is, because it actually contains large amounts of facts instead of the usual insults just aimed at those who disagree. But this journalist who wrote the article that she's criticizing is as far left as you can go, and he directly attacks people for mentioning correct numbers regarding immigration and refugees, and then means that they're, I quote, helping racists and Nazis by mentioning facts. Newsflash. Racists don't need facts to be racist, that actually tends to be the reason to why they're racist in the first place. He's also written about this very charming group of people named the Revolutionary Front and claimed that they're not, I quote, anti-democratic, end of quote. For those of you who never heard about these asshats before, they're a group of extreme socialist, anti-capitalist, anti-racists who like to kick people half to death, trash people's cars, attack them in their homes with axes, try to get them fired from their jobs, and threaten those who politically disagree with them. These fascists will actually attack you in your home, probably get away with it, because liberal news media has for a very long time defended these types of movements because they consider them to be, I quote, the good guys. Like this journalist, for instance, who defends their, I quote, ideology, but not their methods. Okay, well, he's now gonna explain to us anyway how immoral Angelot Alstad is for not believing in refugees being economically beneficial for Sweden. Here comes his response to the article that Angelot Alstad wrote, you know, the article with all the facts and the statistics. So he is basically going to refute all of that. So let's start reading. They don't know anything and they can do nothing. Living like gnats and eating us out of our own house, the idea that the refugee would be able to rescue growth, public finances and pensions are all just a racket. Such perceptions about refugees as a socially destructive force are not unusual among the more blue and yellow groups, but these ideas are now being spread from the left by Angelot Alstad. Just a quick comment here already. When he writes about the, I quote, more blue and yellow groups, he's talking about Nazis. That's all he's talking about, in case that wasn't clear. I'm not at all being oversensitive here. Any type of nationalism, according to Sweden's liberal news media, directly means that you're a Nazi. You love Sweden? Well, then you also hate immigrants and refugees. That's how that works in their view. So we're just a few sentences in, and the first Nazi insinuation seed has already been planted. We're off to a great start here, people. So let's continue reading. Yes, she even makes the immigrants responsible for a growing inequality, which in fact is caused by the richest percent. <laughs> Increasing their income and manipulating political decisions, especially tax credit. What? Okay, l okay, like a good little busy idiot comrade, it only took a couple of more sentences before he begins to complain about successful people who like to keep some of the money they earn and not pour all of it into the leaking tax pot of our government's irresponsible immigration policies. Those bastards. The fact that Swedish business owners, who get most brutally taxed compared to all other European countries, might also help explain why they'd like some tax credits in order to not have to move abroad like a lot of companies are already doing. But more about that later on. Also, don't ever talk to me about manipulating political decisions, you moronic hypocrite. Manipulation is all that Sweden's political left ever does. Guilt spreading and shit slinging are your favorite weapons of choice, so don't even go there. So here comes a little bit of a background. This is what the woman who wrote the first article wrote about growing inequality. I quote, The accelerating inequality that is tearing our society apart is most likely the result of the refugee immigration and the last decades of failed integration. End of quote. Every word in this text is backed up by leading experts on these topics in Sweden and it has nothing at all to do with upper class tax credits or whatever commie crap he was just jammering on about. The integration in Sweden has been a failure, even the social democrats have begun to acknowledge this, and the fact that a lot of people on the left still refuse to admit this obvious truth 
just shows how tightly the rose-tinted glasses have been stapled over their eyes. Sure, we have some class problems just like any other country, but this guy is making it sound like our suburbs are burning due to this oligarchy of a society we're living in, where the rich make the poor hate each other while they sit in smoke-filled rooms and giggle with glee. Also, this whole immigration insanity that's been up to our necks is almost entirely an upper middle class idea, so you can't just pin that shit on the top percent of our upper class no matter how hard you try. I know you like to blame the rich for everything, but in this case you just can't. At times they pull off some of those classic tax evasion attempts, but our car crash integration policies are not even close to being their problems. People like you on the other hand, dear journalist who comes from a very specific level of class which allows you to waste time getting a degree in journalism, you are, to a very great extent, the primary perpetrators in this whole mess. Our working class is now being screwed over by the so-called workers' parties and are getting robbed in order to pay housing for people that we don't have housing for. So the social democrats and you on the left are leaking working class voters because the working class have realized that they don't have anything at all to gain from voting for you guys since you now focus more on skin color and oppression than the working class to which you used to belong. So now we have working class voters with bills to pay who are voting for the Sweden Democrats just to be heard and the political left and people in media then fling shit at them for being racists. So how's that for causing inequality? The left's contempt for the working man never ceases to amaze me. Okay, so now I'm gonna keep reading his article here. The answer from us who wish to see a more generous asylum policy tends to be that human rights must be able to cost money, because that makes us civilized people instead of greedy monsters. Uh, end of quote. Okay, would you agree with me when I say that it costs money to be able to properly help people? Or will hugs and kisses, will that suffice? No. Okay. So, is stuffing a family of six into a garage, is that a good permanent solution to the housing crisis? Say, uh, say that man has a garage that man builds up to a house-like house. A house, simply put, a house, a house, that man then can hire out to a person who is new arrived. No, okay, that's a bad idea. So, we agree then that you need money to pay for what these people need in aid. Great. You see, this is why we so-called far-right radicals constantly talk about money. It's because in order for Sweden to be able to help others, we need to maintain a social system that affords us the ability to give aid to people in the Middle East who are in dire need of said aid. So either we need to put some restrictions on the amount of cash you liberal idiots are allowed to rake out of our nation's treasury, or we'll soon be unable to help to the extent that would be needed. That is how cold-hearted we are. You always hear the argument, but Sweden is such a rich country. Yeah? So what? We didn't get rich by running a country on kisses, cupcakes and unicorn farts. You need to choose between maintaining a stable economy and solving social unrest caused by your party's failed integration. You gotta choose between the two, or we can just keep importing the Middle East, pouring money onto the mess, like we're doing in Malmö, a city that at this point is just eating taxpayers' money, is a nest of gang violence and where about 20% of social workers have quit their jobs only last year due to them being overburdened. Let's continue reading. It's in itself a sufficient argument to undo decisions on identification checks, temporary residence permits and more. Because how can we otherwise measure who we are as a people? You're being an idiot. You are honestly a damn caricature of a leftist, a romantic crybaby aborted from reality. Why should we feel the need to measure who we are as a people? Who is tapping their foot, impatiently waiting for us to take a stand? I don't define myself as a Swede by how much I save the world from suffering. Our aid and the politics surrounding its distribution is built upon a balance between a surplus and wealth and our ability to give a part of that surplus to those in need. Nowhere in any of this does it say anything about forming our national identity based upon the amount of this surplus that is given in order to fix messed up countries. In all other circumstances, we as Swedes are claimed to lack a culture, our history is boring, our traditions are boring, all of our culture is apparently imported by other people. This is shit you get told. In Sweden, leftists constantly moan about how we're not a people, as in our national identity is something to be ashamed of, and that Sweden belongs to everyone, and that we should stop being greedy racists for liking the idea of a stable economy and having a nation sovereignty. 
But lo and behold, when it comes to giving financial aid to war-torn countries, well then suddenly we all need to chip in and defend our very clear and important cultural and historical identity as the saviors of the third world. Men, men det är klart att för mig är det en grundläggande fråga. Vad är Sverige för land? Ägs det här landet av de som har bott här i fyra generationer? Eller någon som hittar på någon gräns? Eller är det här ett öppet land som består av de människor som kommer hit mitt i livet? Kanske födda i ett annat land? Och det är vad de gör av Sverige som är Sverige. Let's keep reading. But fortunately, there are also really good opportunities for the asylum immigration to be profitable for both our society and the state. I hear you saying this, but I'm still waiting for any substantial evidence of this being the case. Since Miss Altstad has already tired you with an impressive number parade, I'll spare you from numbers of my own. What? Since Miss Altstad has already tired you with an impressive number parade, I'll spare you from numbers of my own. Let me get this straight. You won't counter the large amount of very real statistics Miss Alstad just showed about the problem being discussed, and instead you're just going to go right ahead and continue to spew unfounded claims like an idiot because you're a good person and I should be ashamed over myself for not agreeing with you? Oh, well, okay then. Please do continue. I really want to see just how deep you can dig the hole you're standing in. The basic problem with her article is that she assumes that this frozen moment will last forever. Unemployment today is unemployment tomorrow. Unskilled people will remain unskilled. Politics from such a perspective is quite powerless. Or just realistic. To base political decisions on what may occur in the future is stupid if you also ignore the current problems and what they may result in in the future if they're left unattended, which our problems with integration and refugees currently are. All right, fingers crossed. Okay, keep reading. But when long-term research and the same Joachim Ruist, whose black and raisins Altstad picks in order to further her arguments, says that it's possible that in 10 to 45 years in the future, it can actually result in that a large migration can be a winning ticket. <laughs> it's possible that in 10 to 45 years, it can be profitable with more or less free immigration. I'm sorry, but who cares? Who in his or her right mind cares what might, perhaps, maybe, will be profitable in 45 years? Are you some kind of idiot, sir? Also, are we talking about the same researcher Joachim Ruist, who in his blog the 20th of December 2015 recommended removing the right to seek asylum in Sweden altogether, since he wrote that it would be the only way of solving the immigration and assimilation problems in Sweden? So this so-called financial gain from a horde of immigrants that might maybe perhaps be beneficial in about 10 to 45 years seems to an economist Joachim Ruist's view now have been superseded by the fact that we need to lock the gates and sort this mess out. It took me only about 0.29 seconds to see that you're full of shit. Check your sources or leave them out, comrade. Alright, I'm gonna continue reading here. The gist of the report's reasoning is that with a generous immigration policy we have a chance of avoiding budget cuts, raising the retirement age and tax shocks due to a retirement crash. With greedy policies this misery will arrive in an orange envelope in the mail. And Sweden our retirement reports are sent in an orange envelope. Please explain to me how come you can basically give a refugee a full pension using money only from the collective tax jar, but in the case of an ethnic Swede you're instead forced to raise the retirement age. How does that shit work? If we're facing problems with giving our elders a reasonable pension, which we are, wouldn't it then only be fair to aid them financially through paid taxes? Taxes they've been paying for all of their lives and that also are extremely high. The argument now regarding refugees is that, well, they're not taking money from anyone's retirement funds, they're just getting money from the taxpayer. Well, okay, so if you're an immigrant who lacks a pension, it's then okay to make the taxpayer pay for that, but if you're an ethnic Swede, then you're expected to work for more years in order to receive a livable pension. I'm not even ripping on refugees here, it's just a really retarded system that isn't fair. But what would happen if you reduced the immigration of those who never paid a dime into the Swedish tax system? What would happen to our grandfathers and our grandmothers then? Would it then maybe be possible to even out their pensions even more using some of the taxes that they've been paying for all of their lives? Would that maybe be something we could do? Okay, moving on. If the employment of overseas immigrants could increase with only 10 to 12 percent, the public finances could be saved for decades. Wishful thinking? Well, such an increase could, I quote, not be regarded as unrealistic, end of quote, writes the Swedish government's long-term research. A 10 to 12 percent increase in employment rate is not only anything in numerically challenged tit. 
a 10 to 12 percent increase across the board among refugees and economic migrant employment is a huge change. Today it takes somewhere between 8 to 15 years for a refugee to become completely self-sufficient, meaning not living off government aid and actually paying income tax. And still after just 8 years, only about 32% men and 18% women out of Sweden's total amount of refugees have what you would consider to be a steady job. And since you and your friends in the political left want all residence permits to be made permanent, we now need to have a very serious discussion about these facts. So we have our 32% men and our 18% women refugees working in Sweden after 8 years in the country. But then we also need to consider the fact that according to the International Labour Organization, only working for one hour a week still constitutes having a full-time employment, which is bullshit. So these 32 and 18% can in fact be even lower if we actually stop dicking around with the numbers. But our government really likes dicking around with numbers, so this one hour a week is very often paid for by the government, meaning you, the taxpayer. So you get to pay for the government to invent bullshit jobs where they put refugees to work one hour a week in order to make statistics regarding refugee employment look a lot better. But despite all this effort, the statistics are still shit. <laughs> How this potential is to be realized is another matter. It is here that the political struggle must be, between the left who dares to stimulate demand and to train people for the jobs of the future, and the political right that wants to create new low-wage jobs and a radical right who loves to whine about the cost but don't have any clue about how to pay pensions care when we're all old and grey. Uh, okay, let's pick this lump of idiocy apart here. Between the left who dares to stimulate demand and train people for the jobs of the future. Okay, the political left in Sweden, by its very definition, doesn't care about stimulating demand. Demand causes what they call class oppression. Without people who have specific jobs which has a higher demand, for instance doctors and engineers, there would be no difference in the amount of money which would be possible to acquire for someone who's doing a job. So both demand and merit, which are both extremely important in a society, are largely seen through the eyes of the political left as being something in direct contrast of a fair and equal society. But this is why I don't understand what the hell he's talking about, because if you're a lefty, you don't want to put focus or any type of stimulus on creating demand, because as soon as you do that, it's going to create rifts between different groups of people, for instance, that have different jobs. And training people for the jobs of the future, in essence, means that there would be need for some affirmative action, since Swedish social justice warriors fights back against a society based upon merit, because they think that merit is discriminating, it's oppressive, it's excluding, all that crap. The political right wants you to create new low-wage jobs. Okay, this claim again. Uh, the political right doesn't want to create low-wage jobs. I'm just going to give you a really short reply for this, uh, because it's a pretty long answer otherwise, but it's a very, very common claim, sort of a lie that you hear from the left. Um, it comes from a massively poor understanding of economics, so I want all of you pinko victimizers that probably don't listen to my video I want you to check out the term knowledge capital on Google and I want you to read that shit and then I want you to, you know, write in the comments what a what a prick I am, you know, who defend fascist business owners' uh, oppression of the worker. But uh, please, just check out that term because most people on the left, they have no idea what it is to just sort of view the worker as an empty vessel that constantly gets exploited and passed around like a dirty doll between different businesses. Okay, so this guy is now talking about how we have a radical right who loves to whine about the cost, which is apparently is people like me, but do not have a clue about how to pay for pensions when we're all old and grey. First off, how am I a radical? You're the only one who's a radical here. Compared to your echo chamber buddies at some of Sweden's biggest newspapers, well then yes, then I'm a radical for using logic and facts instead of idealism and feelings. It's not radical to keep using logic even though horrible shit happens in the world. The world can be a horrible place and it's full of suffering. That's not a reason to stop thinking logically. Anyway, our government has hit the emergency brakes and are sweating blood, but idiots like yourself, dear journalist, still claim that a continued onrush of refugees are going to help pay for our pensions when the act might maybe, perhaps, hopefully, still be a smart investment in about 10 to 45 years. Okay. They don't have a clue about how to pay for our pensions care when we're all old and grey? I do in fact have a clue, and I can tell you what we should do immediately to improve our ability to do just that. Number one, lock the gates and keep them locked. 
get out of the Schengen Agreement immediately, and even more preferably, leave the European Union altogether. The Schengen Agreement is a poorly managed security risk in the member states of the EU's repeated failure to secure their own border safety, this of course includes Sweden, is just insane to continue to support. If unable to leave this mess, which we probably are at this point, at least, as a bare minimum, reform our insanely liberal attitude regarding asylum benefits since they're still based upon old policies that were designed for a Sweden still not being a part of Schengen, and thereby receiving far less asylum seekers. Please lower our already sky-high social benefits for asylum seekers, and those who are truly in need and fear for their lives are still going to stay in Sweden, while economic migrants are going to move back home. Number 2. Stop denying visas for asylum seekers if you're still gonna continue to be pussies and not tell them the truth about our lack of housing and our lack of jobs. It's irresponsible and frankly it's kind of sick. You're currently feeding human smugglers and criminal organizations by making sure that refugees keep paying them to get past EU's outer borders while simultaneously making people take meaningless risks in order to get to the promised land in the north. Loudly and clearly inform refugees that it is not possible to come here anymore, but increase any aid sent to the local areas. Number three, put more effort into assimilating people into Swedish society. Spend more resources on schools in our suburbs that are being closed down due to their horrible school results, and begin to deport people who have obviously no reason to be here. One strike, you're out punishments for rape and violent assaults, no matter where you're from, would be a great start as well. Because if you can't contain yourselves long enough as an asylum seeker without raping someone, you're not welcome in Sweden to begin with. Number four, stop treating ethnic Swedes as second to immigrants and refugees, since it's an act which breeds racism and breeds hatred and disgust for our already historically weak government in the eyes of the public. Sweden's population isn't available for people to practice civility upon. Restriktioner för vad som finns, utrymme för offentligt finansiellt och jag kommer vara helt rak och öppen med detta. I hate this son of a bitch. Leaders who don't care for the people aren't leaders and they should be stripped of power immediately. This is a very important point since a lack of trust in our political leaders can cause civil unrest in the form of violent demonstrations and vigilantism, which is a cost in itself. Number five. Put more money into making being a cop more attractive, since our cops are quitting their jobs in record numbers and I don't blame them. We need a better developed police force in order to achieve permanent improvements in this country. Also, stop being such giant pussies about not wanting to, I quote, stir up trouble. We call the police. Um, to be honest, uh, we hadn't anticipated such ex intense aggression. Uh, our cameraman was... Literally... And even they fear their presence will be provocative. Mm -hmm. I think it's better if you go in without us, because mm -hmm. I think it would be... Uh, very aggressive. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if we're young. So, so do, we will stay here, and if it is... That's fine. You, you watch us. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. I think it's better if you go in without us. I think it's better if you go in without us. Without us. Without us. If the police needs armored jeeps, tear gas, and rifles loaded with rubber bullets, give it to them. And stop giving leeway to people who would be punished by the full force of the law if they were white. Show that you're not a racist and punish anyone who would practice vandalism and violent assaults properly and equally no matter social status or cultural background. Everyone should be able to feel secure in our cities, and that include all of those who are living in our suburbs who fear for their safety due to gang violence, stray bullets, and religiously enforced racial attacks in their neighborhoods. Number six, we should also stop bragging about the so-called success of immigration when we import doctors from countries who need them more due to greater problems with a lack of medical aid. If there are any foreigners we should be throwing money at, it's the people who actually can help their countries to create a future by keeping their services close to their countrymen that need them. Sweden and the rest of Europe should put resources into making that doctors, engineers and community organizers remain put and create permanent and realistic futures for the country while fighting to give them the protection and aid they need. Sweden can handle a lack of doctors better than, for instance, countries like Syria. So stop bragging about it. Number seven. Stopping radicalism is by experts primarily done by offering other options and putting people isolated into what is essentially ghettos is a far shittier option than helping them take 
back and rebuild their country. Several terrorists that have gone down to fight for ISIS have been groomed in mosques in our Swedish suburbs in Gothenburg among other cities, and their apathy provided an easy path into radicalization. Also, stop paying for religious cults with taxpayers' money. We're a secular nation. Act like it. Number 8. Sweden could handle a pension reform better than thousands of people who would take somewhere between 8 to 15 years to even get a steady job and become self-sufficient taxpayers, especially since we're one of the countries in the world with the highest tax burden. Our high taxes are a direct result of so many people being outside of the workforce and only about 30% of Sweden's entire lump of cash from taxations are used in healthcare, education and care for the elderly, while the rest is handed out through different kinds of government subsidies. So only someone living in dreamland would seriously believe that these already low 30% will not be further infringed upon if we get a great increase in the percentage of state funds that needs to be fed in order to pay for unemployment subsidies for a growing increase of people getting stuck outside of the job market. Number 9. We're also already taxing the shit out of new businesses that start up in Sweden. Double, in fact, to the tax compared to anything taken from businesses in the rest of Europe. And, in effect, it's eating away at their profits to the point of them either moving away or selling their ideas abroad. Sweden is a great country to start a business in, but after a while, we in practice start sucking innovation dry while at the same time increasing our state funds in order to further state dependency. And yes, comrade, state dependency is a bad thing, and that's why you're crying about unfair tax credit for the upper class is growing increasingly stupid by the hour. So there you go, there we have some real and very doable changes we can do in order to increase our chances of successfully taking care of our elders without also needing to chop off a big slice of the cake to the benefits of economic migrants. So with this future increase in our already record high tax burden, how would any refugee be beneficial for Sweden's economy? 8 to 15 years, people. We keep making it harder for companies to expand and employ more workers, but idiots like this journalist still expects the jobs to just pop out of the ground, ready to be taken by people who have little to no knowledge capital. And let's all just ignore the fact that young people in Sweden are classified as not being adults, as in having their own place and a job, for longer than ever before in Sweden's history. Our currently stricter policy about immigration is temporary, at best, and our whores for politicians are only reacting to the Sweden Democrats gaining momentum. As soon as they as a political movement cease to be a threat, I'm sure our government, or just any government that might come along, will start with this crap all over again. Perhaps I'm cynical, as I very often am, but I just have to ask you, Mr. Journalist, are you and your hive-minded colleagues even aware of how delusional and completely aborted from reality you are? I know this is a question that might, you know, sound a bit oxymoronic, but I'm just really curious. Is there even a bit of conscious effort put into your craziness? Or is it all just beyond your control? You, sir, and the rest of your brood are, in my view, directly harmful to this country. And the expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, has never been more fitting than when talking about people like you. To the rest of you who are perfectly capable of passing a reality check with flying colors, take care of yourselves and I'll talk to you very soon. 